with the development of consumer infocom space, including digital media, online gaming, and startups, entrepreneurship, and has covering responsibilities for the broader ICT industry manpower development. Mr. Kim has extensive experience in the digital media and the venture startup space across various platforms, including online, mobile, and TV. Uh, Mr. Kim also sits on the School of Infocom's advisory committee where he advises us on the future of our curriculum. Mr. Kim has an MBA from University of Chicago, uh, Booth School of Business, and a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from University of California, Los Angeles, UCLA. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Robert Kim. Good afternoon. Uh, allow me to start by uh, thanking Republic Poly for pulling together the first Future Scope and congratulate its team in pulling together industry, academics, government, and most importantly the students to talk about a very important subject matter, which is the future with IDM. Um, this is very cool actually and, and frankly a little distracting having to look at myself. Uh, I wish I didn't have to look at myself and my apologies for you having to look at me now that I know what you're looking at. But uh, never mind, I think uh, we'll have to <laughs> go on. Um, it, it is really exciting for me to address this audience and um, the reason why it's exciting is because all of us here are either involved or are passionate about or are curious and soon to be passionate about the interactive digital media space which is fundamentally changing the way we learn, the way we work, the way we entertain ourselves and it's revolutionizing industries. Now, to me that's exciting. Uh, I've been asked to talk a bit about some of the key trends that are happening out there and some of its implications to hopefully provide some relevant context to the discussions that you'll be having today. So I'll just touch upon a few key points. Um, one, around the tremendous, tremendous growth opportunities. Talk about how the really exciting part is in the innovation and, and how paradigms are really shifting. And of course, um, about what the government is doing to support uh, IDM. So allow me to jump right in. Um, I'm sure you've all heard the many different proclamations about the future of digital media. Lots of stats out there. Uh, but allow me to highlight a few that I think are pretty compelling. Now, remembering the last internet bust, um, many, be, many may be asking why this time is the right time. Why it will be for real this time. And uh, to answer that, allow me to quote Mark Andrezine, who was the founder of Netscape and is really involved in just about every major Silicon Valley deal that you can mention. He states that all the technology required to transform industry through software is finally works and can be widely delivered at global scale. So think about it. Connectivity, 4G broadband, smartphones that are many computers in your, in your hand, uh, the cloud, these things have solved many of the issues that were holding back the industry the last time around. And to support this point, in fact is traditional industries are being impacted. You know about the companies that have gone out of business as a result. You know about borders, blockbusters, and many are becoming digital. So 30% of the music industry's revenues are generated from digital now. I'll also point out that in a survey of global CEOs by IBM, where they asked what factors are driving change for your company and your industry. Technology has jumped from number six in 2006 to number one. It's the number one agent of change according to global CEOs as of 2012. So do you know what happens when people and companies handle the most important parts of the business? they get the top job. I'll give you an example. The president of Universal Music Asia, 
who handles the entire music business, not just the digital part. We're talking talent management, concerts, all of those things. Was formerly the head of digital media. So that's an important point. It means that this area is progressively becoming more important and impactful, and that has a lot of consequences and implications. Now, by the way, this isn't something that's just happening in the U.S. and in North Asia uh, that we are hearing about. This is also happening here in Southeast Asia and in Singapore. A few examples, online gaming. It's already a $600 million industry here in Southeast Asia. It's growing at 17%. It'll be a billion dollar business very soon. In the topic of uh, music, um, I'm aware that there are currently at least 12 music services getting licensing clearances to launch services in Singapore. And you know about Deezer, Spotify, iTunes. Some of them have already made some announcements. They wouldn't do this uh, without a good reason. And I also have to mention digital advertising, which is a key source of revenues for digital businesses. And it's about 8% of total advertising spend as of last year, but the industry is targeting 20% by 2020 of a $2 billion market just in Singapore alone. So that's pretty significant. And if you think about Singapore as the hub for the region, it's an even greater market that you can experience out of Singapore. So uh, no doubt about it, the industry is on a growth trajectory with no end in sight, and we're all in for an amazing ride. But it's not just about digitization, it's not just about taking traditional and moving it to digital. Frankly, it's all of the amazing innovations that is happening. And I'm sure you're probably familiar with a lot of different things happening, but just allow me to give you a few examples. Uh, in, in the subject of learning, uh, I'm reminded of the Khan Academy. I don't know if you're familiar with Khan Academy, but the founder, Salman Khan, uh, former kind of uh, quant job in the, sorry, in the banking industry, uh, four degrees at MIT, he was helping his nephews uh, with their homework, young kids. And he began to take videos and put them online on YouTube uh, so that they could review the lessons that he gave them. And what he discovered was that his nephews actually liked the video Solomon better than the real Solomon. Um, once he got past the kind of uh, the offense, what he realized was that the video con was something that the kids could look at whenever they want to. They could rewind and review as often as they wanted to and needed to without having to feel dumb. And so. You know, this is a lot about what online education is talking about, but um, it goes further than that. As they created the company and, and progressed with the, the content, what they realized from the analytics is that in fact many kids learn at different, in different ways and at different rates. And, but at the end of the day, they all end up in a similar place. So if you look at them at the end of the course, they all look like bright, gifted students. But if you look at them through the course, some of them struggle early, some of them struggle in the middle, late. Uh, but they all kind of get, get to that end. And he asked openly whether the labeling of students is, is really a matter of luck of timing. So once you're labeled bright and if you're struggling, then it's a bright student struggling. And if you're a struggling student who struggles, then you're doing what you're expected to be doing. So he's putting in place systems that will overcome that. So it's a, it's a different way to look at um, students and labeling them and assessing their capabilities. And one more discovery is that with these capabilities, they're experimenting in actual classrooms. And I think there's going to be a talk about flipped classrooms, where kids can do the learning at home. They come to school and do the homework in the classroom with other kids. And with the analytics of teachers, can focus on specific students with the areas that they're struggling in or match up the students that are doing that understand a particular area with students that aren't and allow them to teach each other so it's a completely new paradigm in education and frankly I was blown away uh, when I learned about this and, and it's just another example it's an example of of the kind of innovation that can take place that really has tremendous impact in our lives 
Now allow me to give you another example from the media side, a little bit more fun. And that's YouTube and other content platforms. Now, we all know about kind of the YouTube stars, right? Justin Bieber was discovered on YouTube. Uh, uh, Charisse, uh, of course, you know, Psy, right? Um, but I think the important point is that it's not about cute, novel content that gives people 15 minutes of fame. This is becoming a serious business in a real industry where people from all walks of life are generating six-figure revenues, incomes, all over the world. Now, I was uh, lucky enough to go visit YouTube Spaces in uh, LA. It is a high-end, modern production facility that is put there for the use of the best YouTube content creators. It's a big time. It's the big times for them now. So. Those ladies who have those makeup channels that tell you how to do the makeup, some of the more popular ones are now coming there and collaborating with some of the top women's magazines and getting paid for it. So what they're telling me is that it's not about production value, big budgets. It's about quality of content. It's how compelling it is and great content will draw millions of viewers even if it's made with a webcam. So it's really democratizing the content and no longer is, uh, no longer are few experts and powerful deciding what's hot and what's not, right? Everyone has a chance to get out there and to reach a wider audience if they have genuine uh, content. And uh, just to support this point, uh, I saw a story on CNN, and it was about a music artist who um, had been signed by a major label. So one of the major labels signed her, but she had not made a single dime in years of her work. So she would put out albums, and now she wasn't a major star, she was a niche star. And you know, after all the fees and, and all the costs she literally got nothing and she had to support herself while trying to make music. Well, she decided to go independent and she started to record and distribute herself. And for those who pay a certain amount uh, for the MP3 downloads, she would do special maybe concerts or whatever via Skype or, or give them other types of special content that she would make herself. And, and guess what? For the first time, she's actually able to support herself make a good living from the music that she was doing all along. Uh, it's, it's just another example of how this new emerging uh, world of internet and, and mobility, all of these things are, are opening up new opportunities. Now, in closing out the, the innovation part, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't talk a little bit about analytics because that is such an important uh, subject matter and area of interest for IDA. Um, allow me to just give you one example, which, uh, a few examples, which is, uh, for example, I met a company in San Francisco called Playnomics. Now, this company is a startup founded by some of the rocket scientists from Google uh, and other places, and they look at the personalities and behavior patterns of people playing online games. So it's not just about your demographics, how, what age you are or where you're from. It's about how you behave, whether you're aggressive or more passive, or you're careful or you're not. And they use that to determine the kind of promotions that they give you and the kind of experience that they give you. And as a result, they've been reducing turn, turnover, people leaving. And yes, there's a business impact, but the fundamental point is that with the analytics, they're able to provide their audience with a much more relevant experience. And that's really powerful. Of course you know about Netflix, but you know that the data that they analyze allows them to know what the demands are, even better than the studio. So when House of Cards, um, which is like a political drama, the producers came around, all of the major studios turned them down. But Netflix took them because they knew that that was a specific genre and that approach would work with the audience. And as a result, it's become a huge hit. And a lot of the studios are scratching their heads wondering why they let that go. Now these analytics tools is not something for the big boys that require lots of investments. In fact, it's available to all of us. 
Um, and one good example might, you know, is, is Google for me. Um, I'll tell you a story about a, a person who had a friend who came to him and uh, said, you know, my boyfriend is, has asked me to go to Hawaii uh, in December. And she said, I want to know if he's going to propose to me because they've been dating for a long time. And um, the gentleman said, well, you know, I, I, I can't read his mind. I don't know him. I can't read his mind. But let me, let me uh, do a little research. And what he did was he went on to Google Analytics and he looked for correlations. He did a correlation on keywords of wedding rings and Hawaii vacations. And what he found out was that there is a greater correlation between the two in the winter months around December than there was in the summer months. So he went back to her and basically told her, um, you know, if he had asked you to go in June, uh, maybe, maybe it's just for fun, but since it's in December, I can tell you there's a high probability that he's probably going to propose. And uh, apparently it actually turned out to be true. Um, so imagine all the things that you can do in terms of going out there looking for micro trends, interesting new uh, niche groups that can drive the kind of content and characters that you create for whatever that you're doing. Uh, so the possibilities are, are, are quite amazing. And I would say that, you know, in summary of this part, it's really about creating that better mousetrap. It's about really the compelling user experience, it's about the product. And because, and it's because of the democratization offered by the internet. In fact, um, the CEO of Evernote, if you know that company, stated to us that uh, he doesn't invest in marketing. He invests 100% into the product. He said, today, in today's world, if you've got a good product, people will know about it. And he's become extremely uh, successful with that strategy. Uh, and he says, they will find out, therefore focus on your product. So that's one school of thinking. Uh, to round out this part, um, now definitely it's exciting. It's a lot of amazing possibilities, but I also want to balance that with a little bit of a sobering talk. Um, that is not all going to be red carpet, caviars and champagne. There's going to be a lot of challenges. I think one of the reasons is because, as of right now, and for a little bit of time in the future, the people with the traditional mindset that don't quite get the future or quite understand it outnumber those that do in the corporate environment, frankly. So whether it's your customers or your coworkers or the senior executives that need to make these decisions. There are going to be uh, people who don't understand. And uh, I'm reminded of uh, Thomas Clayton, a, a great thinker, a Harvard Business School professor, who talks about why good managers make bad decisions in the space of innovation. And allow me to just give you some personal, some personal examples, because it's absolutely true. It's not that people are dumb, it's not that people are incapable, they're bad, he said they're great and they're smart, but they're applying the wrong thinking models into these situations. I remember when I was uh, in the media space and broadcasting, um, some of us got together and we were asked to come up with innovation, uh, innovative new products and services. So we got together, we even worked with some handset manufacturers, and we came up with some ideas. But guess what happened when we started to talk about these innovative new ideas? Uh, they suddenly then, put on their good manager hat, their smart MBA, you know, well-educated uh, hats and said, oh, so can you provide verification for your forecast? Are there any other companies who've done this and can prove that this will work? Well, if you think about it, they just asked you to do something no one else has done and they asked you if somebody has already done it and that, that, that is required for them to be able to justify supporting the project. Um, another example, personal example, is when I was in consulting, we were doing a project for a retail operation. And it's a 10-story ten, ten retail operation, and they wanted three floors top to be something new and innovative and, and different. So we first did a lot of brainstorming, came, came up with some you know, crazy ideas. 
But guess what we had to do to decide what ultimately goes into those three floors? We had to do use traditional tools of financial forecasting and evaluation. Guess what ended up being the number one idea? Food court. So that was like their, their main kind of key thing that they wanted to do. Anyways, I, I think the point is that there are going to be difficulties. There are still many that don't quite understand or can uh, facilitate what is happening. But be, be assured that this change is happening uh, and will happen, and it's only a matter of time. Um, so with that, I, I just want to I'll share just a few things about what uh, ID and the government is doing. I'll keep this short um, because this is an important area. And, uh, and just to highlight, some of the things that we are doing is to support education, whether it's uh, continuing education through CTER programs, which funds 50% of the course costs, or supporting communities like technology user groups um, and grassroots organizations. We also support local companies uh, in terms of funding uh, for innovative ideas. Um, and we also help companies, uh, particularly local companies, expand overseas to, to reach a wider market. So due to the time constraints, I'll, I'll leave it at that and, and ask you to go ahead and look um, on the websites. And, and also MDA has, has a lot of programs related to specifically content development. So, uh, ask you to go ahead and look and be happy to answer questions in the future to, specifically about the government. But um, if you remember anything from this uh, talk, I hope that it will be that for you to think differently, to think differently and to be real. Allow me to sum it up with those two phrases. Thinking differently, it's about innovation. That's where the opportunity is. So think differently and be real. You have to be genuine because of the democratization of the internet. You know, it's, it's, you can't cover it up with fancy marketing anymore. So with that, thinking different and being real, uh, I wish you uh, all the luck and great success. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, um, Ladies and gentlemen, we have a slight uh, adjustment of the schedule because our first speaker will have to rush to the airport immediately after this, so we will have to tahan a bit.